inaugural cast of the Omega Wave Show. I'm your host, Bill Shields. Joining me, as always, my co-host, the wonderful, the talented, the beautiful, Mr. Craig Los Cicero for Ben. How you doing today, Craig? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. It's uh, a new experience for me that I've been awaiting to do for a long, long time, and a lot of people told me I should give it a shot, so give it a shot. You know, and I'm really glad you decided to do it with me. We've talked about doing this for what? Five, six years now? Yeah, we've, well, we've known each other for a long, long time. And uh, getting to know each other at the, at the last quarter of our 20-some-odd years of, of uh, friendship, we got to know that we have similar interests off of music. And that was, uh, this was something that we had talked about. I know you were a radio host. And I actually went on to your show once uh, years ago when you were doing, was it In the Dark Radio, was it called? Yeah, that was it. Yeah, it was a really good show. It was really strong stuff. So strong it got you fired, Bill. It was. It, it did. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I remember we talked to some ex-CIA operative. And uh, he was an old man and they had some really uh, interesting stuff to say. But, yeah, we, we had talked about it back then, but I never really had taken it too seriously. So lately, a lot of people have been telling me I should do this. Uh, you know, I don't have any, you know, answers to everything. I think I got a lot more questions and I just, I really feel like, uh, you know, I, I, a lot of people should represent themselves with their freedom of speech a hell of a lot more than they do and it does a lot less damage than they think by getting off their ass and saying something and I'm just one of those people. Yeah, if we could accomplish anything in this show, it's to motivate people to quit being so damn complacent. Get off your ass, do something, take action, otherwise the worst of what we fear is going to come to pass. It may be too late, but you just can't sit there on your ass and let this continue to happen. Yeah, well, you know, everyone's got a different point of view on this, and there's some really intelligent people and well-meaning people that, uh, you know, often say to me, well, there's nothing you can really do about it. You just got to kind of roll with it. And I go backwards, um, you know, I mean, give me a little background about me and, and the reason why I feel like I even have to say anything since I've been a very, very young boy, or since I was a young boy, since I was a very young boy, I've always questioned authority, and uh, something in me had always, what I felt was, was speaking common sense, and you know, when it came to religion and, and church as a, as a child, and I didn't something like the most, you know, I mean, hey, I'm not even going to the religious subject today, but I didn't come from a really corrupt, with this background, I came from uh, a Episcopalian background, which Eddie is our Catholic white, which is pretty well put, but I just saw, you know, a lot of folks just kind of meandering through it and, and looking more forward to their vestry meetings and, and getting a glass of wine with their friends. And I just didn't, you know, it, that alone to me just seemed like, okay, now what, you know, what, are you, what are you doing here? But it all started at a very young age where I questioned everything, and it hasn't stopped. And as I educate myself more, I, I see uh, you know, more pressing issues. And getting back to what you said, Bill, that I think is very important, is that now at this stage, we don't really have time to, you know, and I can say, we don't have time to fuck around. Um, I don't really see that just because it seems like it's unresolvable that it's not worth uh, tackling. I think it's very much worth tackling. I think it's very much worth talking about. And I've always had, you know, said that uh, you know, I, I want to be able to see what's going to hit me in the ass before I die. And I don't want to be the kind of person that's just like, oh, well, I'll just wait for that to come. And, you know, that now being the omega wave is what I call it. And, you know, that being that feeling of impending doom that people have. I mean, there's, there's a, little, a lot of double things in it, but omega wave to me is, is that, that feeling that's just racing over people, just crushing them, knocking them over. Uh, you know, we want to try to make sense of it. We want to try to help people uh, realize there's a lot more of us out there. And I know there's plenty of programs to do this, but uh, what we're going to do is a little different. Yeah, and we're, we're going to take it from the... We're going to take it from the metal point of view, from the metal community. We are a very vastly overlooked community of people, and we got a lot of really intelligent people in this genre of music that are not being heard because uh, it's just metal, satanic, it's bullshit. You know, 
I remember when um, Forbidden Evil came out, your first disc. People jumped on you guys about Chalice of Bud being a satanic song. When it's, there's nothing further from the truth. No, no, nothing further from the truth. And that is that you got to give Russ a lot of credit. He just, you know, uh, grabbed that from his experiences of, of, of growing up in a more of a fundamentalist uh, kind of family. And um, I, I believe uh, he grew up a Jehovah's Witness, actually. So he saw that hypocrisy there. And I look at those lyrics, and they're, they're pretty simple. But man, are they good, you know. Uh, that, that song's really timeless, and it just it strikes a chord, and, and that's, you know, Russ doing what he felt needed to be done at that time. But I, I, I don't think he put a whole lot of thought into how much effect it would have on people down the road um, at that point. You know, we do more when we write lyrics now. Russ and I work together on all this stuff, and, you know, we did our research when we did this last album, and we sat and watched a lot of documentaries, met a lot of stuff. Um, I made sure that if he didn't know about it, he was going to know about it before we wrote about it, and you know, he did the same for me. So I think metal is, is in general, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm getting over a little blue bug. The metal in general is what punk rock used to be when it started, but it's, it's gotten, you know, at its best, it's more articulate and still pissed off and still has that aggression that it needs to convey this message of people's frustrations, which it ultimately is. And, you know, it's an art form. So that's really what this show is about. It's going to be about talking to other artists, the right lyrics that are, that are striking a chord with people, and getting that point of view from my, from your point of view, you as a metal fan, me as a, as a lyricist, um, where they're coming from, what, what their research was to get them to this point, you know, how they basically got to the rabbit hole. That's what this show is going to be about. So hopefully that's a little different format from one artist, other artists like that. Yeah, and it's going to be a great format. It, you know, it's great to have an artist such as yourself and a lyricist because people relate to you guys much better than they do. Um, people call me on my DM cell phone. That. Yeah. So, sorry about that. Don't worry, I'll, there'll be an interruption coming from my end sometime, too. <laughs> so, anyways, you know, people relate to lyricists. That's the you know, part of music that drew me to metal. Originally, the anger, the pissed-offness, the world, you know, not treating me as I deserve to be treated or felt. And, you know, I never really felt that way until I went to a show. And, oh, my God, it just everybody there was mad. But we all got along. I will never forget... Um, we were backstage at Mississippi Nights. I believe um, it was the Death Angel tour with you. 1990. 90, yeah. And that's when um, you remember some kid came up to you and just went on about um, Eyes of Glass and how that song had affected his life and that whole lyric about overweight but underfed. Oh, okay, wait a minute. Uh, this is where I'm a jerk. I'm going to correct you. Overweight but underfed, that's infinite. Okay. But yes, yes. Just, Still overweight but underfed myself. Yeah, you and me both. <laughs> but, so, yeah. uh, but Infinite, it, yeah, what he was relating to, and a lot of people related to in that song, was that, uh, you know, perpetual question, you know, what, when does all this crap stop? And, and I was 20 years old when I, when I wrote those lyrics. And the funny thing about that particular... <laughs> or the song, which is the ending. Not everyone's a Forbidden fan, so they're not all going to relate on this level, but if you go back and, and archives, really, some of the stuff on Forbidden Evil, but Twisting the Form Up was definitely a little bit more informed, and we, we started to really care about what we were saying, whereas the first album was kids basically screaming. And we cared, but we didn't know as much what we were talking about. But that particular lyric was not written until the last day that we could sing it. And, um, it, you know, they basically said, okay, what do you have? And we had something very underwhelming, so I locked myself in a room uh, for about an hour and wrote that whole passage out of the song. And, uh, and it, you know, that stream, stream of consciousness right there was just like a little insight into what rolled through my head. 
that meant a lot to people, and, and a lot of the lyrics on Twist in the Form, uh, I've heard many compliments, and um, you know, people saying that you know, certain things help them through situations, and that's a huge compliment. That's a lot of responsibility, but you know, that's just what we do. Well, you know, I think that's where Forbidden really turned the corner musically, was just like you said, Forbidden Evil was pissed off, angry, um, angry at everything in the world. And Twisted was more of a socially relevant conscious record for the time. And it grew. I mean, Distortion was a, built off of that. Green, which was vastly underrated, was built off of that. Um, with Omega Wave, did you set out to write a socially conscious record? Or was it just what naturally flew out of you? Well, I set out to write a socially conscious record that naturally flew out of me. How's that? Um, and, I, and I didn't do it by myself. I mean, everybody really contributed to the album at one point or another, either, you know, giving me some fodder, things to think about, um, or, you know, whatever. I mean, everybody in the band really contributed on that record one way or another, but Russ and I were the were the lyricists for the most part. Um, and Matt even came up with a couple lines for uh, Dragging My Casket, which is really, really a, a song about people's frustration, um, more like a kid's frustration from the point of view that Russ and I really took it and, and took it away from. Like, how did the kid uh, digest all this information, you know, disseminate it and, and, and figure out how to get from under the weight of something that people, generations before him, did to them, you know? I mean, because that's really the problem here. That's really the problem here, is that this generation can't sit around and proclaim that there's nothing they can do when that's exactly what the generation previous said. And you know what? Each generation, it gets harder and harder. And they fucked it up enough and just sitting back and being distracted by either the baby boom or the first television or, you know, I mean, at the 60s, you had the height of some sort of awareness, but, you know, once they got squashed under the boot of, you know, authoritarianism or whatever you want to call it, then the 70s came and just hit again. And, you know, from that point on, really, we should have never stopped. So we, we, uh, it's up to us to actually you know, voice our opinions loudly and, you know, storm gates, so to speak with our knowledge and our attitude about this stuff. Got to do it now, man. Just, you know, what are you going to do? Leave it to, to my children and their children's children? Get lucky to get that far. You, you know, you're absolutely right. One of the things I wanted to ask you about as well is, who are some of the lyricists in the music business that inspire you? Um, I know Neil Fallon, who we got coming up February 20th, I'm going to interview him, is a big inspiration on you. Um, I, you've used... How, what was the term you used on Neil? Oh, well, to me, he's the Mark Twain of our generation. I think Neil Fallon is incredible. I think if you took Neil Fallon's lyrics, Clutch is a, is, is a great band, but his lyrics are, you know, when he uses the term a lot, his stream of consciousness. Where he comes from when he's writing it, I, I, I'm dying to find out, but he hits the nail on the head as far as I'm concerned, and you should bury those lyrics into a time capsule and have them dug up when this whole place has gone to hell and then they find it again and it will sum up in a very tongue in cheek but right on the money in a way what what was happening with our world that we live in right now. Um, I think that he, he nails it with, you know, some humor that we desperately need to, you know. But he's you know, it's not so much that he's an influence on me because he came later. But he is somebody I really look up to now. Uh, people that influenced me lyrically you know, I was Roger Waters is a, is a great example of somebody that uh, really influenced me at the beginning. Um, you know, then there's other metal stuff. You know, that goes, you know, of course, some of the priest stuff. And but these are this is just like metal influences lyrically. I don't know, man. You know, it really doesn't come down to just a couple a couple guys. It comes down to every a little bit of everybody that I looked up to 